Professor Mahavatra, and uh, students. I've been given uh, two uh, topics uh, to cover. Uh, one is uh, how to revive the Indian party, and the second is about the importance of uh, demographic development for India. The Indian economy uh, was at one stage about a thousand years ago. The best and the most sophisticated profound economy in the world. And this is attested by people who came from all over the world in India. There were Chinese travelers, there were Portuguese travelers, there were travelers from later on from Britain, and then were part of the situation and occupied the country. There were Arabs who came originally in search of uh, goods. So till about uh, thousand year, thousand years ago, India was a, considered as a paradise of earth. The rest of the world was producing practically nothing. There's a well-known uh, landmark in the United States in the Boston area. Uh, the area is uh, there's a big pond in a, in a suburban town called Belmont. Uh, and in that uh, town of Belmont, there is a huge lake and uh, the local municipality has put a car road around the perimeter. As a consequence, it's a place where everybody goes for a walk. And I also used to go there for a walk and I found one big sign there. One place, it said, here stood Tudor Ice Company, which used to export ice to India. Written date 1636. I was taken aback. I said, Why would anyone export ice? I said, Why would India want to export import ice? And how did it go? Those days we didn't have refrigeration. So I googled the Tudor Ice Company and I found there was a book, a part of the book. And broadly speaking, the story is that. Traders used from Massachusetts used to go to India in the 17th century and buy uh, cloth, spices, and so on. And then uh, they used to uh, learn about medicine, get medicines also, even with other medicines. And they was regularly going and coming, and one day, the, and that was in Kachipuram area. They went to the Kachipuram area. And there was a port in those days. And the, one day the king of Kanchipuram, uh, who was a part of the Chola Empire, he invited uh, them to his kingdom and asked them, uh, you know, you've been coming years, now I want to know, are you happy with the goods that you buy here? And so on. And uh, they said, yes, we are very happy with everything, except one man. He said, what is that? He said, our ships have to come empty to India. And we then fill our ships and go back. Can you not buy, buy something from us? So the king laughed and he said, India produces everything for me that I can buy from you. They said, well, that is for you to decide but, uh, we, uh, what you need. But uh, we would like you to buy something so that we don't come empty. So then he said, you see, I've never seen ice in my life. I know there's plenty of ice in Himalayas, but I have to go a long distance for that. And I heard in your country, ice falls from the sky. And he didn't know about snowfall. So ice falls from the sky. And therefore, if you can bring ice, I will buy it. So in the winter, that uh, uh, or freezes. And so these traders then uh, cut those uh, the, the the lake and put sawdust on it and took it all the way to India. 
So the first uh, export from the United States was ice to India. What a change has taken place. Others also who came uh, mentioned it and India began to really decline in a sharp way after 1700. Because uh, earlier on, looters, traders came, they made a foray and took it away. But later on, they settled here, they formed the dynasties here. And the, so the money was not going out on a regular basis. But the wealth and money in the British period went out on a very systematic basis. I'm giving you all this to show the kind of model we need to revive the economy today. We have always made bad mistakes in the choice of model on ideological grounds. So, in 1857, there was a huge revolt in the country, and that is what we call the first war of independence. The British call it mutiny. And at that time, the British recognized that, uh, uh, that the peasantry of India nationally supported this revolt. So they decided to take the break the back of the Essentially. And that's how the impoverishment of India began. They appointed all the criminals in their contact, the British, as Zamindas. Gave them a, a, uh, a quota. We need so much money to run the establishment of India. By then it had become the government of British India. How much you collect, we don't care. But you must provide us this amount of money annually every year. So these criminals then set about extracting the maximum amount of resources. And slowly, agriculture bled and bled. Zamindas, when they found that the fellow could not pay, take over the land. If there was no land, then they would take over his brother's land. They would take over the women, all kinds of things were done, and Indian agriculture bled to its bone. In 19, by 1947, it was a thoroughly impoverished uh, agriculture. Industry could have picked up, but at that time, and I'll explain, connect this with the demographic data, had India been allowed, the Indians had been allowed to import locomotives. Because from 1100 to 1800, there was a systematic assault on our education system by Islamic rulers. Sanskrit was removed, Persian was brought, all kinds of things were done, and the education system, particularly that of the Gurukul, was disrupted. And uh, Therefore, in the, in the, when the Industrial Revolution took place in the, in the West, they were taken, uh, they happened because the scientific discoveries of India found its way into Europe. Calculus, for example, Bhaskaracharya, he uh, uh, invented calculus, but people give credit to uh, Newton. Have you heard the name Leibniz, any of you? Yes. Leibniz is uh, had a counterclaim. He said, I sent my research papers for comments to Newton and he saw it and passed it off his own. Big Jara Piman. So now they say Newton and did this positive. I don't know whatever it doesn't matter, but they originally was invented in India by Hasanajan. So these scientific discoveries, these are all now documented by Englishmen themselves. So the scientific discoveries in India, which the British East India Company saw. First, uh, gave it back, we had to give back to England, and that led to the science and industrial revolution. So, therefore, even rocketry, if you read any good book on rocketry, you'll find out that the rockets were first used by Indians. That is a fuel which burns and, you know, sets the thing up and then it can be guided to a particular spot. <coughs> but, uh, 
So, industrial revolution came, the locomotive was invented, and then came the SMR steel cars. But uh, Indians could not bring it to India. There was a tremendous attempt in the late 17th, uh, 18th century and early 19th century by Indians to try and bring locomotives to India. The Tagore family was one of them which tried. But the British won't give permission. Till this uh, 1857 uh, or independence took place, then the British realized that uh, the uh, that uh, you know they needed to move the troops past so and then they are brought in themselves they brought in the railways for which India had paid every penny and India was committed to pay 5% dividend guaranteed every year for 99 years 1857 to, uh, to uh, 99 years to make it 1956 so till 56, we will continue to pay 5%. Even after our independence, Jawaharlal Nehru is our half of the English no. So he said, no, 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 we have to honor the difference. And uh, so, therefore, uh, we, we paid it. And But the British were clever, they created broad gauge, medium gauge, narrow gauge. So you can't go from Kanyakumari to Kashmir in one train. Because now you can, thanks to the post but agriculture was completely squeezed. It declined severely. China also had problems with foreigners, but they were ruling China. So Chinese agriculture did not decline. In fact, it was behind India in 1650 and it went ahead of India by 1947. In 1947, we, got, we had an opportunity to revive the economy. But Jawaharlal Nehru, influenced by the communists, chose the Soviet economic model. Soviet economic model is squeeze resources from agriculture and finance, heavy industry. That's the model. And no export, no import. Self sufficient. Unfortunately, there was nothing to squeeze. And therefore, the model failed. We had a, we had a, a terrible famine, a near famine in uh, the 60s, so then the Great Revolution was brought in and slowly, slowly. I said that's true, but now there is no Soviet Union also. So <laughs> 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 it had broken up by then into 16 countries. A little more <laughs> and today you have Russia, no Soviet Union. Russia, Lithuania, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, etc. China before economic reforms, China after economic reforms. So we brought economic reforms to revive the economy. <coughs> there was a growth rate of, uh, we had during the Soviet period of 40 years, 1950 to 1990, there was a growth rate of only 3.5%. The communists were so ashamed of it that they used to call it the Hindu rate of growth. How was the Hindu rate of growth the Soviet model? I don't understand. But anyway, that's what they found it very fast at all. But the economic reform was brought <coughs> into the territory of the territory of Nasimarao. He came as a successor government, and of which I was also minister there, our high level cabinet minister, ranked post of uh, CAC Commission. Recession. It's got nothing to do with the American recession. It's a totally different thing. But today, because my focus, I won't go into the question is what bike we collapsed. 2009 2010. 12 months of the year. That means you can grow three crops. <clears throat> but today, it's 75% of the land we grow in one crop because the farmers still love it on the rain. Transform that. Make water available. There's plenty of water in India. Some rivers are in flood, some rivers are without water. Kaveri has no water, Vaike has no water, but uh, uh, Godavari and uh, uh, Krishna, they are flowing 90-95% of its water is going into the Indian you know, into the Bay of Kerala has 46 rivers and has a dispute on water with Tamil Nadu, which has no water. And 97% of Kerala rivers go into the Arabian Sea. 
So you drop, uh, make a water grid. The canals from the surplus rivers to the deficit rivers. And it, this, this canal will generate a problem because you have to take canals. It will pass through Raya Sima, which has never seen rain in its life. So it, it, the whole agricultural production will be boosted. You can have agriculture three times, three times the production today. Because you'll have three crops. And so agricultural production can be tripled. Then who will buy it? Indian agriculture is the lowest price agriculture in the world. Price of rice, what is the price in Japan? Seven times. What is the price in South Africa? Six times. Europe, America, same thing. They may not be great rice eaters, but the prices are much higher. Take vegetables, much higher in the Middle East. In fact, we try to put back and it starts escaping. I mean, through smuggling. Same thing with fruits, even flowers. Amsterdam is supposed to be the world class place for flowers, but actually, if Indians can have good packaging, standardization, we'll out, uh, you know, uh, out, uh, outbid uh, uh, Amsterdam. Milk, we have 150 million cows in India. What's the average yield of a milk of a cow? 200 liters. What's the average age of a uh, Average yield of an Israeli cow, 11,000 liters. I imagine if 150 million cows of India gave you 11,000 liters on an average, how much milk do you have? You can have a bath in milk. <laughs> can I explain it? What's the price of milk in Europe? 15 times that of India. Why don't we export it? Because the Europeans have put a bag. Find it out to the WTO. Get your get your access. So look at the abundance of agriculture. And on top of that, <coughs> on top of that, if you compare the yield per acre of rice, wheat, vegetables, fruits, all this, in the Indian Council of Agricultural Research Plus with the rest of India you will find that Indian agricultural, uh, uh, agricultural, Indian Council of Agricultural Research plots are giving you something like 7 to 8 times what you get in the other plots in India. So in the same country, the same land and the same mud can produce you 7 times under experimental conditions. So why can't we do it in the rest of the country? At least do it double for triple. So the potential of agriculture in north. Similarly, in uh, most other things also. We have great advantages in certain areas. When we are trying to find the Toyota and now bring out a new car for uh, less than uh, 50 lakhs, which will use hydrogen fuel cells, like a battery. You only, you only charge it once a day and you can drive during the day for 350. Okay, now they start shale oil. Then only the oil companies are telling the American president, the American candidates for president, listen, we'll campaign against you if you shift to hydrogen fuel cells. It's a much cleaner fuel, much better. But India can, we have done the research on it. And if India does, China will also copy it. Because they also have a problem. <laughs> so, if all these countries start shifting to hydrogen fuel cells, what will happen to the Arab countries? All the Arabs will have to go back to their tanks and start climbing on camels. Because their entire oil resources, to oil, the entire resources today depends on just digging a hole in the ground and getting something, uh, you know, the crushing out of the crude oil and then selling it internationally at high prices. So, this is another potential for you, uh, another restriction you can remove in your time. We have already demonstrated our capacity to produce high class industrial goods where there is a focus. You know Japan has a price called demi-price. 
It's named after a professor of statistics at Harvard called Demi, Richard Demi, who invented this quality control charts for being ancillaries. Every year, in the last 15 years, we have been continuously winning the first prize. Producing quality. We are great experts at adulteration, but I don't know how in the question, I know how in the question of uh, the international competition, you can't stick, you can't stand. Same thing with software. There is a ranking called SCI CMM or CMM SCI. And that is, uh, you know, originally uh, invented by some people in Carnegie Mellon. Where it talks about the quality of software and it gives a ranking from one, the lowest, to highest five. India has 36 companies which have qualified for five. United States only 15. China one. This is this one area we have beaten China. So I, I I would like to tell you that Indians provided with an opportunity. They perform excellently. You see overseas Indians in America, they are now top of the class in every uh, in every field. In all these quiz programs on mathematics, Indians are now attracting Indian Chinese. But American told me that uh, uh, when he was young, his mother used to say, eat up your food, don't waste it. A lot of starving people in India, you know, it's not nice. So he says, but now I tell my son, eat up fast, otherwise the Indians will come and eat it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that's the transformation that is taking place. But what? One step. That is liberalization. We move to a market system. Market system doesn't mean just close your eyes and let the lesson fail. For example, to the, today if somebody tells me, should Walmart come to India? I said no. You are surprised, I'm, a, I'm supposed to be known for free market. I'm also supposed to be known in, in a limited circle though, and for the fact that the blueprints for the economic reform were produced by me, implemented by Mr. Nassim Rao and uh, the credit went to my mom's Because uh, our, our media doesn't like people who talk back to them. <laughs> my mom's doesn't talk at all. So So, the question therefore is that one simple step of removing quotas and, uh, and licenses and so on produce this change. One, uh, one crisis on, this, uh, on the food front in the 60s produced uh, a green revolution. Green revolution is not affected the entire sector, it's only affected small sector. But that's enough to produce so much change. So the potential is enormous. What we need now is a new, a revival coming through a new model of innovations. <coughs> uh, hydrogen fuel cells, right. thorium based nuclear technology. The world will have no uranium left after 2015. They are already preparing to shift to thorium. India has 60% of the world's thorium. Where you find it in the sands of uh, Kerala and Tamil Nadu. I was once surprised when somebody told me that India is smuggling going on beaches of India. I said, don't understand which crack part would want to smuggle sand out of India. Sand everywhere in the world. Why should you smuggle? <coughs> then I realized that. If you want to bring your cheap capital here and take part in our cheap labor, we want to take our cheap labor there and take part in your cheap capital. That's fair. There was an immigration problem. That's your problem. <laughs> you want to come to India? Do this. So I'm only <coughs> telling you 
that the innovation we need to create, we have to build Indians who will think out of the box, who will think of new ways of doing things. Had the locomotive not come, had the Vesela class cars not come, growth rate would have accelerated. Had the jet engines not come, growth rate would not have accelerated. Had internet not come, the growth rate would not have accelerated. Innovation is, is not more capital, more labor. It's more capital, more labor combining with the new innovations, new ways of doing things. And that means younger generation. Because you govern the universities in a position to research for the most recent knowledge you acquire from the universities. And stability, don't lose what you want. And uh, at Harvard, when I, I used to have students from many, many countries, and I used to ask a question, including Indian. I used to ask them, now that you're graduating, what kind of career are you going to go for? Are you going to try something new, fall flat on your face, and lose everything, or succeed, like my, <coughs> Microsoft said, Gates? Become a billionaire. <laughs> you want that or you want a job or your salary, which is the job you would like. So the Americans would ask me, what's the probability I'll fall flat on my face and be ruined? He would ask that question. I said, and then I can answer. But 100% of the Indian students used to reply, no, we like the second job. So why? That's guaranteed poverty. They said, but it is guaranteed, that's important. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the mindset you have to get out of. Take new scope for innovation. We are today liability and an asset. We are viewing it in only as a liability. You train them, educate them, they become innovations. They are the fundamental innovations. So you have to do the cost benefit analysis. But the Americans are pushing, pushing. Then Mrs. Gandhi and Sanjay Gandhi were persuaded. So during the emergency, they did all this. 40 people per day. On a day, you will get a free ambassador card. And in those days, we had only one model available. It's called the ambassador card. It is a 1943 uh, vintage. So every year, there are no alternatives, so we were buying it. Time. The, and this is data from the great part of the population. And the birth rate came down like this. So this period 1916 to 19, uh, 2001. This gap increased because the birth rate was coming down slowly. Oh, okay. That means 1.6 per 100. That means 1.6 per cent. Here. At this stage in uh, 1991, I why I put this the census period. Uh, in this period, we had the highest growth rate, and that uh, was 2.3 percent. So now, the since this peak. Uh, the uh, growth rate has come down to 1.6% in 2011 census, uh, 2011 census. But when this gap increased, not because the birth rate was not coming down, but then was coming down, but it's coming down more slowly than the death rate. <coughs> death rate was going down very fast. Now it's not so fast, now, now we are in the world class. Uh, if we can now take care of maternity 
and uh, infant mortality, uh, and particularly the anti-women uh, uh, forced deaths, etc. Uh, we will come down to American scientists. They only now to focus on maternal, uh, maternal uh, maternity, uh, I mean uh, uh, maternal mortality and infant, uh, infant mortality, and we will be in world class. So this, uh, uh, it was at this time, little before this, that Mrs. Gandhi was persuaded by the world, if you do like China, then what China is doing? Even today, beware of anyone who says, look what China is doing. They don't know what is happening in China. I know what is happening in China because I'm considered a friend, so they let me go everywhere. And I know that China can explode any time. Their financial system can blow up. And uh, <coughs> India will be in a happy position to overtake the ruins of China. That kind of situation could arrive. And you want an example? What happened to Japan? It was going so fast that the Americans were telling me that very soon we will all have to learn Japanese. You see, the American went and the Japanese went to America, they bought a Rockefeller Center, they bought their car industry, the American car industry was done for because of the Japanese export, everything all, radio, seats, everything was coming cheap from Japan. And suddenly in 1997, there was a financial crisis, and boom, Japan has never bought up. Now America has bought up Japan. So all those companies which went bankrupt in um, Japan, the Americans have bought up. So, Therefore, they were all persuading us, you know, how do the, like the Chinese, one child for family, one child for family. Mrs. Gandhi tried that and she lost the election. After that, nobody had changed it. Now we have come in a natural way. Today we have the youngest population among the large countries, 26 years, China 37 years is the average age, America is 38, or Europe is 46. And Japan is 50. Japan was persuaded by the Americans to cut their population and so on. And they fell for it. And as a consequence today, the Japanese are in the uh, They are probably no the market is shrunk. And uh, they have an aging population. Aging population means what? See, now growing population, we don't have social security. But supposing we did have social security. All these new people coming to work. We cut the gratuity, pension, etc. That goes into the government account, and out of that, government pays those who retire. <coughs> but the number of people coming in is larger, the number of people, and the number of people retiring is larger and living longer. So they are a pension form, as it's called. So that's all the mess in Europe is today because of that. And I don't think Europe will get up. In India was a colonization as a retaliation for what they did to us in the past. So, <laughs> so I am saying today that we have got this shoes. Seventy percent of the population below the age of thirty-five. <coughs> Educate today. Education is priority number one. Agriculture, make it globalized, and modernize. Bring in all this IT, this, that, you know, all these techniques and uh, uh, you know, revolutionize education. And that will be the agenda of the next government. I can tell you, we want to see that, and it's not only just getting your degree, huh? that's only cognitive intelligence. It will give you also emotional intelligence. You know what that is? No cigarettes, no drugs, no this thing. You don't tell this to Rahul Gandhi, you'll be disappointed. <laughs> When you are in the university, <laughs> you have to study like a monk. That's why I used to take over. And they made them live a very strict life. Once you get out, by then you have moral values, everything has been formed. And you can decide what you want to do. You have free choice after that. But the fact of the matter is that there are certain habits which have now been proved to be good for your health, good for your long life, healthy long life and also to be able to, uh, to concentrate and, and, and come up with new innovation. So you need, uh, then you must have a risk taking attitude, not oh I want a job, you know that's all I want. Secure job, that's the worst thing that you can possibly want. Try something new, but doesn't matter, get out again, do it again. 
Look at Mohammed Ghori, how many times he came? 16 times. <laughs> there is something to learn from him, although he was a butcher and a murderer and all that. But the fact that he kept coming, and it was our foolishness for him and for the time. But the fact of the matter is that this never give up attitude has to be imbibed in our schools. You must learn Bhagavad Gita that you have only freedom of action. Freedom of, and you have no right to the fruit of that action. You will get fruit, no question. No, I want to know. But you cannot presume that I am putting so much effort, so I must get so much reward. Reward will come in mysterious ways. All you do is, I have to do this, this is the right thing to do, and I do it. This kind of a new mindset this huge population of young people put through moral education is what India needs to revive the Indian economy. Then in India, they do not need a government. People used to say that when Jawaharlal Nehru became Prime Minister, everybody thought a rich man can be Prime Minister. Then when Lal Bahadur Shastri became, they said a poor man also can be Prime Minister. After one more thing says, people are saying you don't need a Prime Minister. <laughs> So we have a list of questions uh, yeah, yeah, from students tonight. Uh, one question is, should Indian economy lean towards conducting inflation or sustaining growth? Well, that's a dumb thing that our reserve bank of government is going to accept. The government policy permits all trading in agricultural commodities. That means that those with black money go to wholesale market, they buy all these uh, products as they come from these farms and put it in cold storage and as the price rises, then they sell and make a huge profit. That's why agricultural prices are going up and down like this. So the focus has to be on growth and uh, all those which create artificial shortages in the market have to be tackled, then you will have growth with stability in prices. Uh, the next question is, will China be friends with neighbors and other countries? China will, uh, will do what? Uh, will be friends with neighbors and other countries. Well, I mean, nobody is going to be friends with them like you or with you look nice or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> they see your strength and they see your intentions. You see, uh, whether if you, if, you, if you trouble them, you are very, very progressive, we can do business with it and we are ready to discuss the bottom of that's how the thoughts are made. That's the way to deal with China. Give something, take something. And uh, as a price, I told them, please open Kailash Mansar also. When I went, before I went, Moraji told me that never will be. They are a communist country. How can they open a religious place? I said, well, you know, I know how to do business in China. I should be. <laughs> Argue with them. They first said, no, no, this is a problem, sir, this, that. I said, no, no, no. Okay, this is our religious place, you must have to open it for them. They agree, only condition that shall be put on me is that I will go there first, which was hell by the way, going all the way, climbing 22,000 feet, going across, and it had been open for 35 years, so there are all bushes, snakes, all kinds of problems were there, but anyway, it's a lovely place, I would advise all of you to take a trip once. Now there is an easier route, you can go by, by road via Nepal. You don't have to walk like I have to walk. But they agree to that. Today you want to deal with China, there are two things you have to do. First, make friends with the Indonesians and tell them that you are on Sumatra, we are in Kabikova. Okay, so the difference is there, there's, a, there's a sea between us, it's called the Malacca Strait. Let us have a treaty that we will control the traffic in Malacca Strait. Where there are pirates and groups and so many other things that are coming. Let our two nations <coughs> jointly patrol them. Ninety percent of the Chinese goods traffic passes through Malacca Strait. Whether they are exporting or importing, it passes through Malacca Strait. So, like Suez Canal, if we shut it down, China is a big trouble. They don't have that kind of navy to. Uh, come and fight with us. And once they start the fight, then the Americans will get to the act, the Vietnamese will get to the act, the Russians will get to it. 
and I can't do it. So, you can tell the Chinese that uh, you don't have to announce to them when you squeeze your traffic or anything, but just doing this is enough. Then tell them that if the Americans and the Chinese have a problem over Taiwan, then we will be neutral. Because they are under the impression that we are students of America. Not very difficult to come to that conclusion today, after seeing the way Mr. Mamon Singh Jinnuplex before Obama. <laughs> so, but we have to make it clear. We have to tell the Americans also. We go by our interests. You go by your interests. You are supporting Pakistan, the one that is, which, uh, you know, sending, uh, cutting our soldiers' heads off and all that, because it suits your interest. We have our interests too. So, in that way, if you can demonstrate to the Chinese to their satisfaction that you are an independent country, China will be the most reasonable country. Now they have an additional problem. Trained militants, trained, because the Tibetans are not reconciled. So, use the Air Force and bomb that supply. We are to apply our aerogroups are just on. Uh, Facebook and other places are just on the border. They have a problem, they have become long distances. They cannot sustain a war uh, on the border. Furthermore, uh, as I pointed out to them, when they told me that Hackman line was drawn by a British imperialist, how can we agree to a border drawn by a British imperialist? I told them that I agree with you 100 percent but why did you agree to Hackman line with Burma? You know, Burma they signed to the people. Macmahon line grew up, that time Burma was part of India. So Macmahon drew a line for India and for Burma. Because Burma was part of India. And the Chinese refused to accept for our, us, but they are ready to accept for Burma. And this is the treaty that the common border between China and Burma is Macmahon line. I said, if you want to accept it for Burma, there is no question of imperialism or all that office focus. We want you to settle on the thing. I will tell you the Chinese are difficult on the border only because of these other issues. So if these other issues then they will be definitely uh, they will be definitely friendly. We must be friends with China. They we never had a problem with them for 2500 years till 1962. I don't want to go into the question who, who did what wrong or like that's all past history. But the fact is that how is it when Europe, every country was fighting with every other country? France with Germany, Germany with Britain, Britain with Spain. All this fighting, was fighting, fighting all the time. And it took 2,500 years, no fight. Not a single fight. Because we respected each other's culture. We interacted with each other. And uh, therefore I think it is and their, uh, their cultural system is very similar to ours, family, this, that, all these issues which all the Chinese bother our families too. So, we must be, they are two big land masses, huge population. Uh, we must come together, work together, without doing all this Hindi Chini Bai Bai business or, you know, closing your eyes and romanticizing China. One Sakaji recently went to a friend of mine called Shusi. He went to China and came back. And I asked him, how did you find China? He said, the Chinese people are very nice. So I said, why? He said, they, they have everyday Chinese food. <laughs> so, therefore, we need to be non-emotional, on practical terms, give and take. You, India, China, combination, the United Nations will be deadly. And the whole world is working to see it doesn't happen. Let us not fall into that time. Can you please elaborate on your proposed Swadeshi plan as an alternative to the five-year plans and Hindu renaissance? Well, first of all, uh, Swadeshi, I don't mean everything produced in India. I mean everything standing on own feet. If you want to buy something from outside, you must be able to pay. Today, we are on nuts, you see. We, we say foreign money. We are going to great limits, I mean beyond all limits to get money from abroad. Earlier on it was begging for uh, World Bank aid, then the American aid, we were taking from governments. Now we are not taking from governments, we are now asking for companies to come. And, uh, and it's all leading to all kinds of corruption. What has happened in telecom? 
what has happened, what is the jet that the art deal? Uh, they, on the grounds that the jet, jet doesn't have money, we are now practically handing over the airline to, uh, to ATR. Uh, so, uh, give you Walmart. Why should Walmart come to India? Yes, Walmart will go to China. Because China, the communist revolution, they killed all the traders. We have not grown our traders. They don't have any traders. So they have no marketing facility. And therefore they said, well, we'll do the marketing facility for Chinese goods through the American uh, Walmart. It makes sense for China, it doesn't make sense for us. So, therefore, uh, I am not in favor of autarky, that is, stand alone, like, you know, uh, shut down all your doors, close all your doors, no. and trade. You buy, you sell, you give, you take, that sort of thing. The second thing is that where your indigenous resources, don't distribute it free or for what we call as the crony considerations. If you had optioned a uh, spectrum, you would have got 1 lakh 76 uh, spectrum 2G. Uh, I hope you know what 2G and 1G is. Uh, one more thing didn't know, he told me this is uh, G and Sonia. <laughs> So, if you have 2G, you would have got uh, the income tax and harassing you and all that is only 2 lakh crores. 3G will be no 4 lakh crores. 4G will come when you can send 10,000 pages of documents through your mobile phone. That time, that 2G will sell if you, if you auction it, not give it away. If you auction it, you will get 7 lakh crores. If you had optioned this four blocks, would have got 11 lakh crores. Then in nearby your Krishna Godavari in Dhatra, if you had Mr. Hindi free to accompany you had optioned it, you would have 24 lakh crores. Now, who are these imposters? Not Muslims, they are only convicted. Not Christians, they ruled another 200 years. Not Brahmin, they will be must have ruled 10,000 years. <laughs> no Shatriyas, no Vaishyas, or even farming Sudras, that is, you know, Yadavas, and Kurmians. No, not, not Jars, because they were rulers. That Suraj Mal was a terrific ruler. No, he was fierce as they come. Uh, only people who have had socially imposed disability are the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes. For them, one generation we can take. Why one generation? Because they all have the same DNA. Let me tell you, the Brahmin DNA and the scheduled caste DNA are the same. You want to do it, go and uh, read the Cambridge University Journal of Genetics. I have done this study myself. Uh, I did it for uh, Raj Tatre in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Because he was saying that all these UP Maharaj are stealing our Marathi's uh, employment. <laughs> <laughs> these taxi Maharaj are coming here and driving my car, they drive the taxi in UP. So I asked a friend of mine, you know, uh, I also know him, he's a nice fellow actually, but uh, he just uh, thought this room to get him to do the business. But uh, I, I have said, do you know this fellow, can you get me a sample of his hair? <laughs> because DNA can be blood, my blood, my skin, uh, hair. So he said, yes, yes, I, I go to the same hairdresser as him. <laughs> <laughs> I got a bottle of his hair. Then I went and asked the taxi driver, can you give me uh, one, one of your hair? Or I'll give you 100 rupees. He looked at me and I was mad. <laughs> anyway, he said, there was no I sent it to Hyderabad for the microbiology to the laboratory. And the DNA turned out to be the same. <laughs> so I announced in Bombay that even that actually came from UP because the DNA is the same. <laughs> so, uh, I came to once they get admitted, they don't send them empty assets. It is known as pass outside world, but inside the university is known as gentleman pass. 
When he came back, he deputed himself to call him Pandit Nehru. Now, Bhimra and Pandit Nehru, they should have done the opposite. They should have said Javadas and Pandit Ambedkar. That should have been there. There is no difference, therefore, between one Indian and another Indian. We have the same DNA, irrespective of caste, even Muslims and Hindus have the same DNA, Christians and Hindus have the same DNA. And therefore, if some section has been socially suppressed deliberately, like the Shidu caste and the Shidu tribe, they will get reservation, nobody else. And no reservation and promotion. And uh, one generation. That should be the policy of our Really one question open to the audience present here. One question maybe you can ask. Uh, you talk about the education system, which is degraded systematically. Uh, what is your model to bring it to that level? Yeah. Well, uh, I would like the concept of neighborhood schools to start. You can't send people to boarding school in Simla or Dehradun. But you must send your children to your neighborhood. Whether they are poor, rich, whether they are children of your servants, and all of this. Primary education should be free. And the government should ensure it is high quality. We must not worry about whether the classroom structure, blackboard, this other. We must ensure that it is digitally wired. Today we have courses which can be taught by the best in the country through the internet. Okay, so we must make sure that not only they are teachers, but they also get exposed to the internet education. Second is that we must ensure that for semi-skilled employment, the economy develops agriculture, develops uh, uh, food processing industries, uh, textiles, so that after school plus two, you don't have to go to college. You can get employment and then of course then you can do part-time, etc. and get an additional degree if you want. But this pressure to go to college must be reduced by making semi-skilled employment available in a large scale. That has been neglected. We need to take pride in software requirement and all that, but this is really basically for a very select few. We must be make sure that the employment is available to semi state. And there's a demand for it, and there are ITIs for it, other IITs, but ITIs. So, this is the second method. Third is at the university level, your courses should motivate you to do research. And I would like to do away with the examination system altogether. Have uh, teachers administer take home exams. Don't encourage mugging, uh, you know, just memorizing, uh, you know, seminars, discussions, etc. Over the question, why? That was the original concept of the Hindu. He would always ask, why? Why? Everything, why? Today, any child in America, of course, today all children will be wanting, why? 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 In India, if, uh, if you ask more than two, why you get a slap? <laughs> you know, behave yourself. We don't encourage but questioning mind. So that questioning mind must be encouraged in a big way. Liberal, uh, today we only spend one and a half percent of our GDP on R&D. I would like to spend six percent. So the universities are not short of money. I would like to encourage alumni uh, or to start the university. The Harvard University doesn't get any money from government, except individual scholars, scholars get a scholarship uh, or a grant for doing a particular research. But the university is run on the money of elements. And they are the board of governors, they are the board of directors, they are the executive councils. So we must now make the, the, the those who pass out from a particular place to be to be motivated to invest their money. Okay. Today we have a lot of people are making a lot of money and we should make that all tax exempt. And so on. In fact, there will be no taxes, so they don't have to worry about tax exemption also. So that is the kind of system I would like. I would like the orientation towards the 
questioning my research, finding new ways of doing things. And Indians are capable of it, but they have to be touched. That's the part of I'm working on. Sir? Sir, yeah. is there any way to impose ethics in politics? Because as to this trend, the rivals among the politicians, that is, that is hampering the Indian economy. Yeah. Because the party is coming to a uh, position, he is ruling the country for 5 to 10 years or something like that. Then the other party, the opposition party, he is creating, uh, when he is coming up, when those parties are coming to try to come into the position, they are backstabbing or something like that, work plan party. So there can be any fair uh, rivals. No, backstabbing is only inside the party, it's not between opposition and ruling. No, so the media is picking up those things to the public. No, no, we criticize the uh, ruling party, that is not backstabbing, that is open stabbing. Backstabbing only you can do in the during the clandestine month. I understand what your problem is. Well, I think first of all, we have to change this culture we have got from the British. You see, the British have one very clear policy. If anyone is a nationalist, <coughs> try and make him a communist. Because the British Communist Party would then be able to control it. If he is an implacable nationalist, send him to Andamans and try to destroy him. The South has what, 22 years? In the jail. Someone will always be in German. So, the, uh, this mindset, you see, you know, what do the British think of us or what? Yeah, I was told recently to go because the British Prime Minister is going, yeah, British is a small country. And I was, it's as big as the American, one of the American aircraft carriers. If I play and all that happens in the American place, land in Britain, for the war, in uh, London and take off in Scotland. So, the question is why this mindset has to uh, change. So, uh, I think these are the ways in which you can, uh, you know, rectify this. Yeah. Any more questions? One last question. Yes, there it is. And certainly while you're at the university, I don't want you to have anything to do with political parties. You can have discussions, ideology, this, that, but don't encourage any, don't identify yourself with any political party. Except in the elections, you may have to vote. That time you may decide which party to vote. But must encourage people to go to politics. Today, if you can't do anything else, then go to politics. <laughs> This has become the last refuge or first refuge of every school. That has to change and it, it can be and, it, and once you come in you have to fight. It's not going to be easy. These people are only well set. So that's what now tell me what it's uh, recently like I saw a few biographies of a few successful people like Steve Jobs, Donald Trump and all. And uh, what I saw in their biographies that they all were using marijuana. But sir, in our society, we are always told that it's something very uh, insane to do and it's a sin to do marijuana and all. So I am very confused between these two things. Like in our society, we are told that it's insane to do such things. But I've read and uh, seen many biographies of many people who have been doing this and they have been creative to this. So am I wrong or right, sir? Sin is not the right word. Yeah, exactly, sir. It's a different thing. It's a it is, it is creating an artificial uh, mental consciousness which you should get by healthier methods which don't have side effects. For instance, meditation or uh, um, the right philosophy. Marijuana, what does it do? It makes you, uh, frees you from the normal pressures of life, your unhappiness or something other. You had a problem with your wife, then you want to forget the marijuana and just away. It's like alcohol. Alcohol is pure poison. It wrecks your system, it wrecks your uh, uh, liver, and uh, it's uh, highly expensive. Uh, marijuana, uh, the idea is the same. It, it makes you take, it changes, you know, artificially, it creates a situation where your mindset changes. They may, some people may take marijuana and produce it. That, that's, not, uh, that's not the issue. The issue is that you should be able to do it without money on your own. Thank you. 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 Th
and that uh, can be done by uh, a disciplined mind, which comes from meditation, good habits, and so on. That's what you should strive with. There will be honest people who will take the money on, and you can't stop them. And like we have a system called marriage. There are people who are doing all kinds of things without marriage. <laughs> but, but this institution is necessary. So some people do it, it doesn't matter, but don't make it a habit. So, uh, uh, these things you will not realize unless you go and see a society which has gone into this. See, there were societies which, uh, uh, which were, you know, the Greek society, for example, perhaps because of the use of all these psychedelic methods, you see. So, I would say, uh, you mind must be trained to uh, take shortcuts in life. Harivana is a shortcut. Do the take the long cut. That is Sandy who must learn to later that. Uh, as we have come to an end for question and answer now, uh, I would request we finish with the award of thanks. So I love that Swami is big set at politi politicians <laughs> in a purely economic framework. <laughs> It's been really fantastic how we started with reporting ice and then um, really I was thank you for promoting agriculture and innovation among, among young people here. And that has been the tradition, the culture here is there to promote that. And uh, also, one thing I must say, I've been really confused. I used to think uh, recently that Dr. Swami would make a fantastic finance minister of India. But now I'm thinking should we put him as law minister, education minister, defense <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would really thank you for accepting the invitation from Shrish University and what the students wanted um, and accepting our hospitality. I really wish that you, you know, you're out there, leading the country very soon. Thank you so much.